have a legless anti-hero. I didn't know Deadpool had one leg. All right. Sir Douglas Batter. Let's see what he's talking about. You know, somebody's an absolute gangster when they're not an American, and I'm still going to make a video about them. Today we're talking about Sir Douglas Botta, a World War II oh, British RAF fighter pilot ace with at least 22 confirmed kills, and mm. he managed to do all of that as a double amputee with no legs, which no I think legs? we all agree is a pretty impressive feat. Did I say one leg in the intro? No legs driving a uh, uh, plane? It's a bad man right there. Or lack thereof. But first, a word from our sponsor because this video is brought to you by Permasafe. All right, here's the deal. Permasafe is not the average set of rubber gloves that you've seen at the hospital before. These things are designed for people that work outside of a clinical setting with their hands that still don't want to touch something gross or something hazardous. Mm. Your paramedics, your law enforcement officers, construction workers, mechanics, farmers, anybody that's working a manual labor job where typical rubber gloves simply aren't going to hold up you have Permasafe. These things have diamond texture on the palms so that even if your hands get greasy or wet, you still have traction and you're able to still grab got stuff. That They're grip. also twice as thick and four times more puncture and tear you resistant. Feet. Okay, check That's this crazy. out. Okay, look at this. That's like half a gallon of water inside this rubber glove right now. That's quality. Yo, why he spank you like that? But look, um, that boy's braver than me because I ain't cleaning up that water if it, if it slip out my hand. Jiggling right there, okay? I'm pretty sure this is what the Hulk's jeans are made out of. Oh no, now my hands are all wet from filling up that other glove with a bunch of water. Listen to all the traction and grip I still have with these goddamn gloves. And here's the best part about these. You don't have to go to a special website. You don't have to follow my link. You don't have to use my discount code. You can just go to Amazon. They are on Amazon Prime. Oh, you can fire. order these and have them at your house tomorrow. And I know what you're thinking, but chubby electron guy, I don't need rubber gloves. Okay, listen to me. Rubber gloves are like jumper cables and condoms. You never need them until, until you, you need, need them. them. Just trust me on this one. Go to Amazon, buy yourself a box of Permasafe gloves, keep them in your car, in your garage, and at some point in the future, you're going to be holding something absolutely disgusting in your hands. You're going to be like, wow, that electrician was right. This was definitely worth the money. So yeah, get yourself some Permasafe gloves because shit happens. It just Hawks doesn't come back W over hands. to Celtics. Back to the video. Mm. All right, Douglas Bader, born in London in 1910. World War One was going on when he was a child. His father and his older brother-in-law both fought in World War One. His father was an engineer and his brother-in-law was a fighter pilot. Because of that, young Douglas knew that he wanted to be a fighter pilot too. So mm. fast forward 1928, Bada's 18 years old. He just graduated from high school. He immediately joins the RAF as a cadet pilot as well as going the to Cambridge RAF for is what and while doing that country? he would become a star athlete for both organizations while at Cambridge he would the play Russian hockey Air Force? box and become a star rugby player apparently he was so good at rugby that it was believed that after college he would join the national team to represent his country and then for the RAF mm. he would end up playing on their official cricket team I have no idea what cricket is and I really don't care to learn nobody understands cricket you gotta know what a crumpet is to understand cricket <laughs> I mean yeah I thought crumpet was the mountain that the Grinch lived on so obviously I have no idea what's going on. Fast forward again, two years, 1930. He's still going to college at Cambridge, but he graduates from a cadet to a full-fledged commissioned pilot in the RAF, at which point he becomes known as an absolute daredevil while also being extremely talented. He can pull off every aerial maneuver known to man How at this he point, get no legs, including though? some that are so dangerous that they're banned. And not only does he do those maneuvers, he does them below 2,000 feet, which is also against the rules because it's extremely dangerous. But Bader doesn't care about rules. He doesn't care what you tell him. That's just guidelines. He's going to do what he wants. Because of that, mm. he actually gets selected to represent his squadron at the Hendon Air Show in a flying competition, which he wins. Then later that year in 1931, one, he is preparing to go defend his title at the Hendon Air Show in early 1932, at which point he tries a dangerous maneuver too close to the ground, and the wing of his Bristol Bulldog catches the ground, crashes the entire plane, oh. crushing his legs. Because of this, both of his legs would have to get amputated. Yo, that's crazy putting the, f the shoes out like that for the, for the, that's crazy. One above the knee and one just below the knee. At this point, you have to remember it's the 1930s. He is told that he's never going to be able to walk again without mm. crutches. And that's what they believe because nobody had ever done it before. But you also have to remember, Bada doesn't care what people tell him. The same attitude that got him into this mess by not listening to get the him rules out. is the same attitude that's going to get him out of this mess by not listening to what the experts tell him he's going to be capable of doing. Over the course of his re Rehabilitation. not only does he regain the ability to walk without crutches or a cane, something he was told was going to be impossible, he also regains the ability to drive his sports car, golf. Yo, listen, I'm calling the authorities. 
if I see a man driving with no feet, you're done. I don't care which, no. If you can't feel your big toe out like you SpongeBob during his driving test, you're done. All right. Both and Dan. It was a joke. Listen, listen. Ableist Holla has introduced. No, I'm joking. Dance <laughs> all on dual prosthetics. And he managed to do all of that in four months, essentially by himself, because all the experts thought it was impossible. It wasn't like modern day where there's an expert that has a refined process on how to help somebody out in his situation. No, this man blazed the entire path on his own with no background in physical therapy. He just figured it out. So fast forward June 1932, five months after losing both of his legs That's he shows crazy. back up to the RAF like hey guys made a full recovery let's get me up in one of those planes so I can take it for a spin at which point they tell him absolutely not you don't have your legs we're not going to let you fly <laughs> he then argues with the RAF to which they and agree the that they're going to let him have a test flight with another pilot and if he does good everything should be fine you so think I'm about to you you crashed the plane okay now you got no legs now you want me to be the co-pilot <laughs> y'all are cooked that's exactly what they do he takes a plane up he does a bunch of maneuvers he lands the plane all with the use of his prosthetic legs no problem whatsoever because he is a phenomenal pilot he then gets cleared by a medical board saying that he is fit for active duty and he is reinstated as a pilot mm. fast forward one year later april 1933 the raf for seemingly no reason decided that they were going to reverse that decision and ground him because there was nothing in the king's regulations in regards to a there's no way pilot. to take it to which bada's like yeah no shit i'm the first guy that's ever done it ever that's why you guys put me through all that testing and a med board to see if i could do it and i've been doing it for the last year why would you ground me now to which the raf was like don't really care that's what we decided fuck you get out of the plane bada <laughs> is then informed that he has to pick a new job where he stays on the ground and bada being he's a man of his stature isn't going to stand for that shit so he retires early from there he spends the next couple of years collecting his military pension working a desk job golfing 36 holes a day he also meets his wife and starts to settle down then over the course of 1937 1938 douglas would write the air ministry multiple times saying hey if the next world war is going to kick off, let me know. I'm happy to come back and fly a plane for you. Then fast forward, sure enough, September 1st, 1939, Germany invades Poland. World War II kicks off and mm. the RAF finally decides to call back Douglas Bob. What movie is this? So Douglas shows back up at an RAF base and he is pumped because last time he was flying planes was eight years ago and they were like old biplanes like his Bristol Bulldog. Now they got spitfires, they got hurricanes, planes have come a long ways in eight years and he is absolutely thrilled mm. to be able to get up and fly one. And at this point, RAF leadership yet again informs Douglas, you oh, we're not it. actually going to let you fly a plane. You don't have any legs. That would be preposterous. We thought you wanted to join the war effort and do a ground job just to help out. <laughs> at which point... Douglas is furious. I'll be I'm a pissed peacock. Too. You gotta let me fly. Luckily, however, some of the people that Douglas had served with prior eight years ago were now Not higher sure. ranking officers and they had some pull and they convinced the higher leadership to give this guy a shot because he's an incredible pilot. So the higher ups finally agree to give Douglas a shot, but that shot entails him going back through flight school all over again, which he does. And after his first 11 hours of flying with an instructor, he is finally allowed to take up a plane on his own. 11 and the hours, first that's thing decent. he does is invert it and fly it upside down Dante at a low good. altitude right past all the instructors. Basically giving all of the instructors the middle finger. He then peels off and goes and does a bunch of other maneuvers and you have to realize this is the first time he's been inside of the cockpit of a plane by himself in, in like years. a decade and last time he was flying a plane solo it was his Bristol Bulldog which is a biplane and now he's flying a Spitfire. This is a huge upgrade and he is blown away at how incredible this plane handles. He's able to take turns and pull off maneuvers way tighter and way faster than he ever would have dreamed of being able to do inside of a biplane. And initially, he gives all the credit to the new airplane and how advanced aircrafts have become. But then over the course of a little bit more training, he starts to realize not all the other pilots can pull off these turns and maneuvers as he tight said, and as fast me. as he can inside of the Spitfire. They have the same plane. Is he just that much better than these guys or what is going on? And then it dawns on him. Well, you ain't got no legs, Lieutenant Dane. Yes, I know that. He realizes that it's all because of G-Force, because when a pilot takes a turn or does a maneuver, they're exposed to G-Force, and if they do it too fast or too tight, they're exposed to too much G-Force, all the blood out. in their body rushes down to their legs, and they lose consciousness. Okay, you see where this is going? Doug doesn't have any legs for the blood...
Fan was basically a cheat code for this. This is insane. The rush to G Force is just Viagra to this guy at this point. Dude is literally the real life version of Star Fox. That was a good one. That was a good force is just Viagra to this guy at this point because it doesn't go to his legs. So the most south it could go. My man was a peen warrior. Dude is literally the real life version of Star Fox. Yeah, remember the Nintendo video game? You ever notice how Star Fox and everybody in his crew all have metal legs? According to the internet lore, it's because they all had their legs amputated to resist G-Force more. In a weird twist of fate, his disability has turned into a physical what? advantage inside the cockpit of a fighter plane. He quite literally has a leg up on the competition. That's crazy. And because of this, a lot of other fighter pilots and high-ranking officers in the RAF start to not like Bada because they claim that he's arrogant and difficult to work with because here he is getting told he's never going to walk again. Not only does he walk again, he learns how to golf, he learns how to drive a car. And people are and mad now, at that? here he is out-piloting most of them. What an arrogant prick. Luckily, Doug doesn't really give a shit. He's not here to make friends. He's here to win a war, and that's exactly what he sets about doing. His first combat mission is over the skies of Dunkirk during Operation Dynamo. Mm. If you don't know, this is the operation where they had to evacuate the entire British military from Dunkirk. Yes, this is what the movie Dunkirk is about. If you don't know, watch basically when Germany took over France using their new Blitzkrieg tactic, they took over France so fast that the British army couldn't even get a foothold inside of France to start fighting back. The entire military was caught and surrounded in the city of Dunkirk and they had to evacuate their entire army barely making it out with their lives. And Douglas Botta was in the skies over Dunkirk in a Spitfire running defense for these guys while they got evacuated. Mm. During this time, Botta claimed to have shot down five German Messerschmitt BF 109s, but he is only officially credited with shooting down one and potentially damaging several others. Because every time Botta says that he shot down an enemy plane, it is extremely scrutinized because again, a lot of the other fighter pilots they were mad? don't like him because they think he's an arrogant prick. So literally every plane that Botta is officially credited with shooting down has been spotted by him his wingmen and an independent third party on the ground to verify that he shot that plane down before they would give him credit for it that but that's is insane point. Whether you know how much of a hater you gotta be you're mad because i i do my job better than you and you thought i wasn't able or even allowed to even try to do this job at all so now you gotta you gotta extra hard grade my test put a put a proctor in a room when i'm in the skies collecting my kills shot down one enemy or Sick five time, ultimately doesn't time. really matter because douglas bada and the rest of the raf were able to hold off the german air force from bombing the men on the ground long enough for the entire British military to get evacuated so that they could live to fight another day. Mm. And because of this, Douglas was promoted to squadron leader and given command of Squadron 242, or at least what was left of it. You see, Squadron 242 was a bunch of Canadian hurricane pilots that had been stationed in France and had been fighting the Luftwaffe for a while, and they had sustained heavy losses and their morale was cripplingly low. Bada comes in as their new leader, turns the entire squadron around, takes a squadron in shambles, and turns oh, no, oh, them no. into an effective fighting force again, <laughs> cutting through red tape and bureaucratic bullshit to get his men what they needed to be successful and because of this even more of his peers and the chain of command starts to like him less because he is sticking up for his subordinates and to me this is the most important part of the entire story because as this story continues to go on you're going to notice that the more successful this man becomes the more and more some people tend to not like him and try to trash his reputation i've watched countless interviews of other people talking about their relationship with douglas botta when he was alive and all of their opinions can be summed up into one of two opinion number one he is a literal superhero opinion mm. number two he was an arrogant prick but even i can't deny he was a good fighter pilot hey and man, oddly enough all of the people it. that thought he was an arrogant prick were fighter pilots that were in an adjacent unit or leaders that were in an adjacent unit not his unit because his chain of command they knew absolutely he was him. loved him and all of the men that served underneath him also absolutely loved him. To give you an idea of how highly his men thought of him, one of the pilots that served underneath him, Sir Alan Smith, later in life said in an interview about the time that Douglas Botta made him second in command for a mission, it felt like God had told me to come up and keep an eye on heaven for him. Which to <laughs> me says everything because I think how you're perceived by your so subordinates the Michael is Jordan, a far better a metric pilot, of your character exactly. than how you are seen by the people competing against you for a promotion.
Huh! I'm pretty sure you're wrong because I read on the internet one time that somebody's grandpa met him once during World War II and that guy's grandpa told him that Douglas Bada wasn't very polite. Huh. Jesus Christ. Okay, first of all, word of mouth four degrees removed is not a reputable source, so I don't really care. Second of mm. all, even if that was true, let's put it into perspective. The people... Your grandpa met the guy while he was in World War II. Okay, so at this point in time, Douglas Bada is literally a legless man in the biggest ass kicking contest the world has ever seen <laughs> and he's winning okay the guy's probably got a lot on his plate it wouldn't surprise me if he was a little stressed out and maybe angry sometimes okay shit happens get over it you know what i'm sorry i'm getting sidetracked it just really really annoys me when people that have never met somebody go out of their way to shit on their True. legacy for doing something incredible because it makes them feel better about themselves Anyways, moving on. All right, fast forward July 1940, Douglas and Squadron 242 are going to partake in the defense of Great Britain during the Battle of Britain, which if you don't know, is a period in time between July and October of 1940 where the Germans essentially tried to bomb Great Britain every single day. During this time, Squadron 242 is credited with shooting down 62 enemies and only having mm. four of their own shot down. Of those 62 enemies that were shot down, Crazy four of them were shot down by Douglas Bada. This would bring his career total to five, officially making him an ace fighter pilot. Because of this, news outlets pick up the story and they begin to portray Douglas as the hero of the Battle of Great Britain. Oh, they're really, they are about to lose their mind. When they, when they start giving, when the people pick the person that everybody's hating on, the haters get louder, more disgruntled, upset. Okay. Essentially using him for pure propaganda. Like, hey, check this out. Great Britain has a legless. My man looked like he listened to get it sexy. Get his <laughs> fighter ace. And he is helping to win the war against the Nazis. We literally have a legless man beating you guys in an ass kicking contest. What's up? So now Douglas That's is getting crazy. all this attention. He's being used for effective propaganda, which is great, but it also serves to drive the divide even further between him and the other fighter pilots that already didn't like him because now they're jealous that he's getting a bunch of attention for doing just as well as a lot of them did. And if that wasn't bad enough, he's now also on the shit list of the really high ranking officers in the RAF because he had the audacity to back up his boss and friend, Lee Mallory. Basically mm. the standard operating procedure for the RAF during the defense of Britain was kind of like aerial guerrilla tactics. As soon as they identified an incoming bombing run, they would scramble a small group of RAF fighters that would go up and utilize hit and run tactics to shoot down the bombers. Mm. Lee Mallory, on the other hand, thought that they should respond with overwhelming force in a strategy that he referred to as the big wing. And this was essentially taking somewhere between three and five squadrons in one giant formation, like 50 to 70 fighter planes Dang. all at once and running right towards the bombing runs. And Douglas agreed that this was a good strategy and he was a huge proponent of it. Ultimately, throughout the Battle of Britain, the big wing was only used five times. Of the five times that it was used, the men that flew in the formation said that it was incredibly effective and they shot down a bunch of enemies. The men that did not fly in the formation said, it wasn't said that it wasn't as effective as they're claiming it was and that they're lying. So that aspect has kind of been unknown, Bruh, but we do know for certain really that planes haters. flying in the big wing formation were safer because their safety in numbers, that makes sense, they were less likely to get shot down. The downside of the big wing was that it took a lot of time to get that many planes up in the air and in formation, so response time was lower. So as far as which plane was was better aerial guerrilla warfare or the big wing i'm not really sure but one thing is for certain using both of them multiple times had a beneficial effect because mm. the first time the big wing was used all the german pilots were being told that great britain only had 10 15 20 aircraft I mean, left and they go out on this bombing see 30 of them thing here comes 70 spitfires 70. and hurricanes and just oh fucks up their whole day it had a devastating effect on enemy morale and on top of that now they don't know what the british tactics are they have have to both anticipate being attacked with overwhelming numbers and being attacked with a small, fast, responsive hit and run force, Ooh. which made it very difficult for the Germans to plan their attacks because now they had to plan for both overwhelming numbers and a fast, responsive force. So yeah, in addition to his newfound fame, people are also upset that he had the audacity to have an opinion of how to conduct aerial warfare, mm. even though he's an ace fighter pilot, and presumably an expert in aerial warfare, but 
whatever. Regardless, Douglas ends up getting a promotion to wing commander, and he is now in charge of three squadrons instead of one. So then, from late 1940 to August of 1941, Douglas and his men take the fight to the Germans, flying hundreds of missions, shooting down a ton of Germans. Mm. Douglas himself shoots down an additional 17, bringing his career 17? total to 22, six probables, and a bunch more shared. But on August 9th, 1941, Douglas Botta would fly his last mission ever when he would collide in midair with a German Messerschmitt oh, BF-1. I thought, I thought he was going to have the happy ever after. I thought he was going to get out the war. Oh, yeah, 86 years old. You know what I'm saying? Nine. Somehow, Douglas survives the initial impact, but his plane is absolutely going down. So he quickly opens the canopy and goes to climb out of the plane. But the impact has crushed one of his prosthetic legs inside the cockpit, and he can't get out. So he's pulling on it. He's pulling on it. He's desperately trying to get out of this plane, and time is running out. He only has a few seconds left, and he says... Fuck it, it's worth a shot. And he opens his parachute while and still the inside leg rips the plane. Off. His parachute catches wind and rips him out of his prosthetic and out of the cockpit. Yes, sir. He attempts to evade German capture, hopping around on a single prosthetic leg. He is eventually captured and becomes yeah. a prisoner of war. Okay, now to be fair, technically we don't know for sure that it was a mid-air collision that he was involved in because his plane was never recovered. And like I said, everything Douglas reports back is extremely scrutinized because leadership That's... doesn't like him. Yo, they and they came to the haters. conclusion that Douglas made up the mid-air collision story because he didn't want to have to admit that he was shot down and bested by a German pilot. And the reasoning for that is that the German documentation captured after the war didn't show that there was any mid-air collision around this time period. Here's a caveat to that. The documentation also didn't show that they shot down Douglas either. So now the leading mm. theory is that he was actually a victim of friendly fire somehow. Which you know what, to be fair, as much as I want to have Bada's back on this one, if you take a step back and really look at it, it does make perfect sense because what person in their right mind would take the word of their own guy who was fucking there and lived through it over the word of the German military in the 1940s? <laughs> I mean, the Germans back then were just batting a hundred. They never fucking lied about anything ever. They definitely didn't build an entire military in secrecy, violating the True. Treaty of Versailles so they could try to take over the fucking planet. And they definitely didn't. Yo, Germany was really trying to 1v everybody, dog. That is, yo insane time Have has anybody else tried to do that and I, I guess maybe like the way we look at it now is states and countries back then like i mean before germany back when it was like empires and stuff it was like areas you know so i don't know a crazy military dictator dosed up on amphetamines and testosterone who people were literally scared to give him bad news there's no way that they would lie on this documentation. All right, so back to Douglas. He's hanging out at this POW camp with one prosthetic leg. Word finally gets spread around throughout Britain and throughout the German ranks that they finally caught the famous legless fighter ace that the British had. And upon hearing that, one of Germany's most famous fighter pilot aces, Adolf Galland, who had apparently been running missions against Bada for a while now, wanted to go meet him in person. And for whatever reason, he's actually nice to Bada, so nice that he actually writes the British government and is like, hey, we got your guy, he's missing one of his legs would you guys mind airdropping another prosthetic for him so he could walk around mm. to which britain is like absolutely sure why not great britain launches operation leg where they are given free passage through german airspace to airdrop an extra prosthetic leg for bada and then after dropping the leg they kept going and bombed the local power plant okay look if you're not cheating you're not trying you don't like it don't <laughs> try to take over the entire world i don't know what else to tell you so now that bot has got both his legs he decides it is going to be his personal mission to be the biggest pain in the ass humanly possible he is going to constantly try to escape the pow camp and he is going to with fuck with the guards every you, chance you think he got there and it was like hey bro we see you got one prosthetic leg still on we're gonna give you another one he gets or as he calls it goon baiting one of his first attempts at escape he's on like the third story of a hospital so he takes all the bed sheets he can find ties them together in a rope just like you see in the movies ties it to the radiator nah. in the room throws the rope out the window but the rope isn't long enough and he's looking around he's like shit what else can i use there's a guy in a coma that he's sharing the room with so he ties the rope to that guy's bed frame and pushes 
the guy in the coma bed over to the window to get it close enough to the ground. He repels down to the ground and runs off, but the Germans catch him again. Then after he gets out of the hospital, he goes to a normal POW camp where he tries to Andy Dufresne like his way out. Archer, he tries to Uncharted. dig a tunnel out of the POW camp using his prosthetic leg as a shovel and taking all the excess dirt that he has, <laughs> putting it inside of his prosthetic leg and walking a ways with it before falling down to dump out all the excess dirt so they never see any big dirt piles. But eventually that plan gets busted too. And then in August of 1942, after a year in captivity, he finally makes it out of the POW camp. Okay. He escapes and he's gone for like 36 hours. They put out a nationwide manhunt. They're getting posters ready. They are absolutely going to find caught this him. guy. They were getting their ass kicked by him in aerial combat. There is no way that these guys back. are going to admit that a man with no legs was able to escape their POW camp. <laughs> Eventually, they do end up tracking him down, take him back into custody, at which point they decide they're going to send him to Colditz Castle, which is believed to be an inescapable prison, which is apparently where he has Believe to go to because be. they are absolutely not going to let the guy with no legs get away. And that is where he would remain until 1945 when the U.S. Army liberated him and returned him home. Mm. From there, he would receive a hero's welcome, retire from the RAF, and then a movie would be made about his life called Reach for the Sky. It is considered to be a classic piece of British film. Reach for the Sky. Is this is this where Buzz Lightyear got his thing from? Hold on. Let me see. And it made him one of the most famous men on the planet at this point in time. He then decided that he was going to use all of his newfound fame to put out the message that it was still possible to accomplish things after a horrific injury and becoming disabled. Shout out to that man. And he became one of, if not the biggest advocate for disabled people on the planet. For this service to the world, he would end up getting knighted by the queen and officially become Sir Douglas Botta. He would then continue to travel and give talks and advocate for the rest of his life until passing away at the age of 72 on September 5th, 1982. But one of those Shout talks that he gave is actually my favorite part of this entire story because it really captures how much of an anti-hero Douglas Botta really was. He was giving a speech at an all-girls school telling his incredible story about being a pilot during World War II. Hey, how and at some point during story that mode? story, he says, we'll start and that. I quote, we'll start so that. there were two of the fuckers behind me, three of the fuckers to my right, and another fucker on the left. At this point, the audience is like, and the headmistress of the school has all the color drained from her face and she goes ghost white and she's like, ladies, ladies, a fucking is a German aircraft. At which point, Sir Douglas Bader replies, and I quote, that may be madame, but these fuckers were Messerschmitts. Thank you for watching. Messerschmitts, what's the that? Go check out thefatelectrician.com, get some merch, subscribe to Patreon. Thanks for watching. Quack bang, out. Almost missed the, the links uh, haters scene. will go to just to hate will never ever cease to amaze. Me. Yeah, haters is is a crazy thing. If your life's so miserable that you out here hating on people, you gotta relax, man. All right, it's it's never that deep. Let people live their life if they successful. All you gotta do give them two hand claps, go on your merry way. You're done. But hey, Sir Douglas, uh, batter, b botter, he's him.